What you are, so is your world. Everything in the universe is resolved into your own inward experience. It matters little what is without, for it is all a reflection of your own state of consciousness. It matters everything what you are within, for everything without will be mirrored and colored accordingly. All that you positively know is contained in your own experience. All that you ever will know must pass through the gateway of experience and so become part of yourself. Your own thoughts, desires and aspirations comprise your world and, to you, all that there is in the universe of beauty and joy and bliss or of ugliness and sorrow and pain is contained within yourself. By your own thoughts you make or mar your life, your world, your universe. As you build within by the power of thought, so will your outward life and circumstances shape themselves accordingly. Whatsoever you harbor in the inmost chambers of your heart will, sooner or later, by the inevitable law of reaction, shape itself in your outward life. The soul that is impure, sordid and selfish, is gravitating with unerring precision toward misfortune and catastrophe. The soul that is pure, unselfish and noble, is gravitating with equal precision toward happiness and prosperity. Every soul attracts its own, and nothing can possibly come to it that does not belong to it. To realize this is to recognize the universality of divine law. The incidents of every human life, which both make and mar, are drawn to it by the quality and power of its own inner thought life. Every soul is a complex combination of gathered experiences and thoughts, and the body is but an improvised vehicle for its manifestation. What, therefore, your thoughts are, that is your real self, and the world around, both animate and inanimate, wears the aspect with which your thoughts clothe it. All that we are is the result of what we have thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. Thus said Buddha. And it therefore follows that if a man is happy, it is because he dwells in happy thoughts. If miserable, because he dwells in despondent and debilitating thoughts. Whether one be fearful or fearless, foolish or wise, troubled or serene, within that soul lies the cause of its own state or states, and never without. And now I seem to hear a chorus of voices exclaim, But do you really mean to say that outward circumstances do not affect our minds? I do not say that. But I say this, and know it to be an infallible truth, that circumstances can only affect you in so far as you allow them to do so. You are swayed by circumstances because you have not a right understanding of the nature, use, and power of thought. You believe, and upon this little word belief hang all our sorrows and joys, that outward things have the power to make or mar your life. By so doing, you submit to those outward things, confess that you are their slave, and they your unconditional master. By so doing, you invest them with a power which they did not, of themselves, possess, and you succumb, in reality, not to the mere circumstances, but to the gloom or gladness, the fear or hope, the strength or weakness, which your thought spirit has thrown around them. I knew two men who, at an early age, lost the hard-earned savings of years. One was very deeply troubled, and gave way to chagrin, worry, and despondency. The other, on reading in his morning paper that the bank in which his money was deposited had hopelessly failed, and that he had lost all, quietly and firmly remarked, Well, it's gone, and trouble and worry won't bring it back, but hard work will. He went to work with renewed vigor, and rapidly became prosperous, while the former man, continuing to mourn the loss of his money and to grumble at his bad luck, remained the sport and tool of adverse circumstances, in reality, of his own weak and slavish thoughts. The loss of money was a curse to the one because he clothed the event with dark and dreary thoughts. It was a blessing to the other 
because he threw around it thoughts of strength, of hope, and renewed endeavor. If circumstances had the power to bless or harm, they would bless and harm all men alike. But the fact that the same circumstances will be alike good and bad to different souls proves that the good or bad is not in the circumstance, but only in the mind of him that encounters it. When you begin to realize this, you will begin to control your thoughts, to regulate and discipline your mind, and to rebuild the inward temple of your soul, eliminating all useless and superfluous material, and incorporating into your being thoughts alone of joy and serenity, of strength and life, of compassion and love, of beauty and immortality. And as you do this, you will become joyful and serene, strong and healthy, compassionate and loving, and beautiful with the beauty of immortality. And as we clothe events with the drapery of our own thoughts, so likewise do we clothe the objects of the visible world around us, and where one sees harmony and beauty, another sees revolting ugliness. An enthusiastic naturalist was one day roaming the country lanes in pursuit of his hobby, and during his rambles came upon a pool of brackish water near a farmyard. As he proceeded to fill a small bottle with the water for the purpose of examination under the microscope, he dilated, with more enthusiasm than discretion, to an uncultivated son of the plough who stood close by, upon the hidden and innumerable wonders contained in the pool and concluded by saying, Yes, my friend, within this pool is contained a hundred, nay, a million universes, had we but the sense or instrument by which we could apprehend them. And the unsophisticated one ponderously remarked, I know the water be full of tadpoles, but they be easy to catch. Where the naturalist, his mind stored with the knowledge of natural facts, saw beauty, harmony, in hidden glory, the mind unenlightened upon those things saw only an offensive mud puddle. The wild flower which the casual wayfarer thoughtlessly tramples upon is, to the spiritual eye of the poet, an angelic messenger from the invisible. To the many, the ocean is but a dreary expanse of water on which ships sail and are sometimes wrecked. To the soul of the musician it is a living thing, and he hears, in all its changing moods, divine harmonies. Where the ordinary mind sees disaster and confusion, the mind of the philosopher sees the most perfect sequence of cause and effect. And where the materialist sees nothing but endless death, the mystic sees pulsating and eternal life. And as we clothe both events and objects with our own thoughts, so likewise do we clothe the souls of others in the garments of our own thoughts. The suspicious believe everybody to be suspicious. The liar feels secure in the thought that he is not so foolish as to believe that there is such a phenomenon as a strictly truthful person. The envious see envy in every soul. The miser thinks everybody is eager to get his money. He who has subordinated conscious in the making of his wealth sleeps with a revolver under his pillow, wrapped in the delusion that the world is full of consciousless people who are eager to rob him and the abandoned sensualist looks upon the saint as a hypocrite. On the other hand, those who dwell in loving thoughts see that in all which calls forth their love and sympathy, the trusting and honest are not troubled by suspicions, the good-natured and charitable who rejoice at the good fortunes of others scarcely know what envy means, and he who has realized the divine within himself recognizes it in all beings even in the beasts. And men and women are confirmed in their mental outlook because of the fact that, by the law of cause and effect, they attract to themselves that which they send forth, and so come in contact with people similar to themselves. The old adage, birds of a feather flock together, has a deeper significance than is generally attached to it, for in the thought world, as in the world of matter, each clings to its kind. Do you wish for kindness? Be kind. Do you ask for truth? Be true. What you give of yourself you find. The world is a reflex of you. If you are one of those who are praying for and looking forward to 
a happier world beyond the grave. Here is a message of gladness for you. You may enter into and realize that happy world now. It fills the whole universe, and it is within you, waiting for you to find, acknowledge, and possess. Said one who knew the inner laws of being. When men shall lo here, or lo there, go not after them. The kingdom of God is within you. What you have to do is believe this. Simply believe it with a mind unshadowed by doubt, and then meditate upon it until you understand it. You will then begin to purify and to build your inner world, and as you proceed, passing from revelation to revelation, from realization to realization, you will discover the utter powerlessness of outward things beside the magic potency of a self-governed soul. If thou wouldst right the world, and banish all its evils and its woes, make its wild places bloom, and its drear deserts blossom as the rose, then write thyself. If thou wouldst turn the world from its long, lone captivity and sin, restore all broken hearts, slay grief, and let sweet consolation in, turn thou thyself. If thou wouldst cure the world of its long sickness, end its grief and pain, bring in all healing joy, and give to the afflicted rest again, then cure thyself. If thou wouldst wake the world out of its dream of death and darkening strife, bring it to love and peace and light and brightness of eternal life, wake thou thyself. <laughs>